Today, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different topics, some of the principles of green software, and then we're going to go straight into measuring software and scoring your software for carbon. What makes software green? What does green mean? And you know, when we first started this space, there's a lot of different definitions of what green can mean. A, we're really focusing right now on carbon emissions. We may change that over the years to kind of focus and broaden the horizon to other environmental targets. But right now, the focus is just carbon emissions. When we talk about carbon emissions, we're really talking about a couple of these key concepts. So there's basically three pillars of green software, and they all stem from something called carbon efficiency. So what we say is that everything we do in life, we emit carbon. I'm breathing right now. I'm emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Um, we're never going to stop. Our applications are always going to emit carbon into the atmosphere. So our goal is to emit um, em, what's called carbon efficiency, which is to emit the least amount of carbon possible. There's really just three things you can do to make your application green, uh, greener. Um, one is what's called energy efficiency, one's called hardware efficiency, and one's called carbon awareness. I want to talk through some of this stuff today. Start off with carbon efficiency. So as I said, you know, our goal is just carbon emissions. And just, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, there's the things called greenhouse gases in, in our atmosphere, and they act like a blanket warming up the planet. Um, and they're pretty much just a function of, of the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. So our goal is just to reduce the amount of carbon there is in our atmosphere. And then the temperature of the planet goes back to kind of where it should be right now. Now, I mentioned greenhouse gases, and people always talk about carbon. Greenhouse gases, carbon. Why are we just talking about carbon? There are loads of different types of greenhouse gases uh, that, that have this kind of warming potential on the Earth. Carbon dioxide is the most common, but there's loads of others. Methane, for instance, is another greenhouse gas, and it actually has about 40 times, 40 to 100, depending on, its, on its life, uh, where it is in its life cycle, uh, warming effect as carbon. But it'll just, we'll just spend ages just sitting here, like listing off car, uh, all the different greenhouse gases. So what normally happens is we, we normalize everything to something called carbon dioxide equivalent. So we'll call one ton of methane, we'll call it 40 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And that's why we just always talk about carbon. Whenever time I say carbon, I'm actually talking about all greenhouse gases um, in, in the atmosphere. So a carbon efficient application just emits the least amount of carbon possible. That is kind of one of the first principles of green software. If you just walk out of the room right now, that's, that's, your, that's it, that's your North Star. Just emit the least amount of carbon. If, 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 when you've got choices and you can think, well, this choice emits less carbon than this choice, that's good enough. You can walk off and just make that, make that decision. Um, let's talk about the second principle, which is energy efficiency. Now, when I first started in this space, I knew nothing about electricity, which was just, now I think how crazy that is. My, my whole world revolves around electricity. Everything I do needs electricity. I, I, had, I had no idea what electricity even was. Do you? I have no idea how it was made. Um, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would assume it's clean. When you plug something into a wall socket, there's no smell. It's not like turning on like a, an internal combustion engine car. There's no exhaust pipe. There's nothing. So you just assume it's, it's a clean resource. But in fact, electricity is one of the most, it's, it's the single biggest emitter of carbon into our atmosphere is the creation of electricity. That's because most electricity is still created through the burning of fossil fuels, mostly coal and mostly actually the dirtiest coal on the earth because the, um, the higher quality coal turns out creates acid rain. So we stopped using the higher quality coal and we started using the lower quality coal because uh, it emits more greenhouse gases, but no acid rain. So. so electricity really isn't clean. It's kind of whatever you get from your wall socket is a mixture of whatever's getting pumped into the grid, be it coal, uh, oil, natural gas, uh, renewables as well, and nuclear and things like that. But predominantly about 80%, the global average is about 80% of coal, is what energy is made from, electricity is made from. How do we measure electricity? Now you need to, I'm teaching, teaching all these terms, because if at the end I'm gonna show you an equation to measure the carbon score of software, you better know all the terms I'm gonna be putting into this equation. So how do we measure electricity? I don't even know how we measured electricity. I, I, I can't believe I didn't know that. Um, a, a joule, you probably heard the term joule, a joule is a, is a volume of electricity. A watt is a rate. A watt means one joule a second. A kilowatt is therefore a rate. It's 1,000 joules per second. 
a kilowatt hour is a volume of electricity. It's if you let that run for an hour, what is the volume of electricity you would use? That's a kilowatt hour. Then that, and oftentimes when you see, um, uh, this is kind of one of the ways you measure the volume of electricity that you know your software is using is kilowatt hour. And there's a really, you know, when we talk about energy efficiency, there's actually, it's really interesting topic. So there's a, a concept called energy proportionality, which again, I didn't know this stuff when I first got into this space. Um, and basically what it turns out, I just assumed that when I wasn't using this laptop, when it was idle, it was using close to zero watts. Um, and when I was using it full, it was using its maximum and everything else was linear in between. It's in fact very non-linear. There's something called static power draw. Every single core in your computer, whether it's being used or not used, is drawing energy. And so there's this idea, there's this concept called energy proportionality, which is basically, if you're not really using a computer that much, it's still drawing a fairly significant amount of electricity. There's a lot of effort being put in by manufacturers and organizations to, to reduce this and straighten this line, but it's still there. And what it means is that an idle computer still, an idle server still consumes a fairly significant amount of electricity. And interestingly, the more you use, the basically the more you use the computer, the better it becomes at turning electricity into useful operations. So the more you use it. So you really want to be, if you've got servers, you really want to be trying to pin them to 100% utilization. You really do. And I've spoken to people at, at Microsoft that you know, really run extremely high performance computing. We've asked them that direct question. Should you target 100? What if the failure rate increases? And they're like, pin it to 100. Because A, you'll never get there. And B, we've done the maths. The failure rate increases, but it's actually better overall. So try and pin it to 100. So uh, that's one of the things uh, about energy efficiency is, is, is energy proportionality. Um, in the data center space, they have a, a, a number called Oh, I keep on forgetting. Yeah, it's power usage effectiveness. I put it in the title so I wouldn't forget. Um, power usage effectiveness. And it's basically a measure of how energy efficient a data center is. So power usage effectiveness is, is a number, 1.5, for instance. And that's, that's 15 kilowatt hours coming in. One of it, like 10, is going to go to actual servers and five is overhead doing other things. If you actually look at all the data center providers and, and everybody, everybody should really, well, it's not mandatory right now in a lot of countries, but everybody really should be publishing out their PUE scores. Microsoft, I, th I forgot, we published ours recently. Um, it's 1.1, 1.2, something like that. I can't quite remember it. Um, but that's kind of like, that's a, that's, a, that's a measure of how energy efficient a data center is. And a lot of effort goes into making data centers energy efficient. Um, but what, how efficient is your application? Because at the end of the day, all the effort's going into putting energy into that server. How, how, how good are you at building software that uses the energy effectively? How much are you wasting around the equation? I've mentioned energy proportionality. That's a waste. How about the features that you're building? Are the features you're building built in an energy efficient way? Could you build them more energy efficiently? Interesting way to look at it. When people think of green, oftentimes in the past, we've thought of, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit worse. You know, the greener option, it's not as good as the non-green option. It's a bit, it's a bit naff. But what green means in our space is, is efficiency, is, is not wasting, it's a lack of waste. You've actually got to be very, very good to be a green engineer because you need to be very, very good at eliminating waste. And that's all that data center people are doing and that's all that we should be doing in the application development space is eliminating the waste and getting the maximum utilization of the energy that we're putting in. And I should mention energy efficiency because Energy, we, we know that electricity is directly linked to carbon because most electricity is created through burning of fossil fuels. So if our goal is to be carbon efficient, our goal is also to be energy efficient. If you can be more energy efficient, regardless of the situation, the context, you can be confident that you're being more carbon efficient. So if you're just focusing on energy efficiency, that's a really good goal to aim for. Another field which is really, really interesting um, is carbon awareness, which you may or may not have heard of. And I'll go into that in a second. But before I go into that, I mentioned electricity is dirty. It varies. So the actual measure of how clean or dirty electricity is, it's called the carbon intensity of electricity. It's a measure. It's a measure of the energy 
systems published for a lot of the, the, the grids out in the world. The, the UK grid has a, has a number as well. And so every, every energy, every bit of electricity coming out through any single socket in the world has a measure of uh, carbon intensity of, of electricity, which is grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. So you know carbon should be EQ. That means all greenhouse gases and kilowatt hours of volume. The global average, I keep on forgetting to get a global average for last year, but then I remember the global average of pre covid 2019 was 519 grams per kilowatt hour. So if you're trying to imagine what that looks like, it's hard to imagine that. Just imagine soot ash in your hands, like half a kilo of soot ash in your hands. And that's what um, is emitted into the atmosphere for one kilowatt hour. I've got an electric car with 64 kilowatt hour batteries. So that's a lot of kilos of carbon that gets emitted into the atmosphere if I was only using um, uh, coal power. I need renewable power to power my car. Um, and that's a measure of how clean or dirty your electricity that's coming out through your plug socket. The thing is, it varies by location. UK, through, I won't get political, but an accident uh, has lots of wind power. Um, so we, we can have times where we have quite a lot of renewable energy. So our, our, our carbon intensity can, can actually be quite low. But depending on what you've got, just each grid in each country in the world just has a different makeup of the fleet of, uh, of power plants they have out there. So, you know, France is actually, it's not, doesn't, not colored here. France is actually extremely low because I think 80% of France's energy is made from nuclear power still. <laughs> and nuclear power is extremely low carbon, might have other impacts, but in terms of carbon, it's very, very low. East coast of the US, can be quite high. We've seen some, I've seen some numbers about two kilos per kilowatt hour for some of the, some of the East Coast data centers uh, around the world. So just because of the makeup of, of, of the different kind of power plants there are, there are Norway is brilliant, lots of fjords, lots of, uh, lots of hydro. So there's lots of different parts of the world have diff, they, their electricity just by default cleaner or, or dirtier. So then you can immediately start thinking, well, I can just run my stuff, just running it in different parts of the world has an impact. This is called carbon awareness. So you, actually, you can actually reduce your emissions by running your software in different parts of the world. But it actually gets even more interesting than that because it actually varies by time. It varies by time. Um, our grid systems, you know, they're built on the, everything, or our whole electricity system around the world is built upon coal and gas. So it's built upon this idea of, you know, if you, want, if you want more electricity, we'll just burn more. Coal, I just think of coal as a, as a battery. It's just a chemical battery, that's all it is. So we, we never really built you know, um, batteries in our grid. Our grids are designed so that if you, if, you, if you switch on a kettle at home, the energy provider has to make more electricity at that moment in time to power your kettle. There's no buffer, it's called balancing, and it's a real challenge for them. And typically, that's fine. What they do is they just, well, fine, I'll burn more coal, I'll burn more oil, things, things like that. Um, but once we start introducing things like wind and solar into the mix, wind and solar you can't control. When the wind's blowing, you get energy. When the sun's shining, you get energy. When there's clouds, the energy just disappears. There's, it adds a lot of variability to the grid. And what started happening now is that as, as regions get more and more wind and solar, at this moment in time, they only had to burn up this much coal and gas, so the, the, the carbon intensity was lower. The wind died down, the sun got clouds, and so they just quickly had to burn, it's usually gas in that moment, they just quickly burn gas because it's quick, to get, to get enough electricity to feed the grid. Oh, if they don't, if they don't feed enough electricity into the grid, you get something called a brownout, which is things start flickering. You don't really get them in the UK. Things start flickering and you know things don't work. A blackout is actually a similar thing, but when there's too much electricity that goes onto the grid. So let's say the wind suddenly started going like mad and so much electricity started going into the grid really, really quickly. Blackout is they have to pull a circuit breaker to stop things burning out. Um, that's an so there's very, so wind and solar kind of added some really interesting things to the, to the mix. But essentially what it means is during the course of a day, uh, your, your carbon intensity will go up and down. It used to be very predictable pre-COVID. Post-COVID, it's all a bit of a mess because we all started working. People used to go into the office at 
eight or nine and leave. And then they used to put on the kettle and watch Coronation Street, whatever. Now it's all a bit of a mix. Everybody's just doing whatever they want at different times of the home. So it's, it's, real, it's really like, it's really complicated now. Although it's starting to go into patterns again. Um, and the, the, the crazy thing is that sometimes we throw away clean energy. Let's say, as I mentioned before, like you know, the wind's blowing and then, and then um, the demand goes down, but we still got wind. What do they do? They throw away. They throw away clean wind power. But coal and gas plants, they can't shut down to zero. It takes like two, three days to, to, to spin back up again. So they always have to be running at a baseline. So oftentimes, when there's too much electricity, they'll throw away renewable energy. And that's a really, so if you were to think, that's the, that's the perfect time to run your applications because that's called, that's, that's zero carbon electricity. And there's more and more and more and more of these moments coming as, as grids start um, adding in more and more renewables. There's many, many more of these moments appearing. And they're perfect moments to use electricity because then you're, you're giving money directly to renewable plants. And then that's going to help accelerate renewable plants um, deployment. Um, so that's kind of this idea of carbon intensity. It's, it's, a, it's a number. There are various sources of this data. We're in the UK. Carbonintensity.org.uk is, is where we'd go to. It is actually 100% free. You don't even need a login and a password to get the API. It's just, you just hit it and it gives you a JSON response with, with the carbon intensity of the UK grid. There's a, a nonprofit called What Time, they're based out of the US. Um, and they provide the data and electricity maps based out of France. And they provide data. They, they tend to have better data for US based grids, North America. And these tend to have better data for European. Uh, European grids, you tend to have to get subscriptions to all of them to get, um, to get a, a complete picture. Um, that's what Microsoft does. Um, and really, I mean, I think so this, this, this is the important thing. So right now what's happening is what's called the energy transition, which is a transition of energy from older, from not necessarily, even necessarily older, but from um, high emitting sources, power plants to renewable power plants. It's actually happening right now. Cost of solar, cost of wind has dropped so much that it's extremely competitive. They're, they're, they're winning just because they're cheaper. And so our goal is just to help accelerate this transition. We just want this to happen as fast as possible. And one of the ways you can, you can help that is by using electricity that's got lower carbon intensity. Because when you're doing that, it means you're using electricity that's coming more from renewable plants and therefore your money is going towards renewable plants. That's another way of thinking about it. So if, you use, you can, if you're using electricity with less carbon intensity, your application is just emitting less carbon on one front, but also you're helping the energy transition because you're, more of your money from your electricity is going towards renewable plants. Um, and that's just another way to think about it. And that's kind of where this field called carbon-aware computing comes from, which is you know, a couple of... There's a, a couple of really high profile examples of this, uh, of big companies deploying uh, carbon aware computing. And essentially it's flexing your software to do more when the carbon intensity is low and therefore is more electricity come from renewables and doing less when the carbon intensity is high and therefore more electricity is coming from high carbon sources. Uh, Microsoft <laughs> recently, oh, I don't think it's gone, I think it's still in preview, uh, Windows 11, uh, it might still be the insiders build right now, but um, it's now, uh, it has a feature where Windows 11 is now going to, uh, it's starting off with just updates. So Windows updates will now more likely to come at lower carbon intensity periods of time um, and less likely to come in higher carbon intensity periods of time. And I think over time you'll see Windows do, doing more and more things uh, in a carbon aware way. Um, uh, Google also have done some wonderful work in the space. So Google's done uh, carbon aware data centers. So we, when Microsoft has focused a little bit more on the Windows world and Google's focused a little bit more on the server world. And Google's done some, some great work to, uh, you know, they just have lots of like very homogenous workloads running on, you know, I, haven't, I, don't know, I can't guess how many servers they're running on. And they're now doing stuff to make that, those workloads flex a little bit more when, do, do more when there's less uh, carbon, uh, when the carbon density is lower. I think they started it last year. 
And they said it, just that initial work, according to their report, reduced Google's carbon emissions by 1%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, it's a lot. Reducing anything in the space by 1% is a humongous amount of effort. Um, so there's some really um, interesting uh, work happening in this space. The foundation is to, to help accelerate more work in this space. The foundation is working on a, on a software development kit called a Carbon West Software Development Kit. Thought workers are getting involved. Or people from lots of different organizations are getting involved. And our goal is to make it just to make it easier for people to build applications that are carbon aware. And one of the reasons why people are really excited about this is because um, you don't really have to architect your applications differently. It's just a choice for when you run things and how you scale things. So if as a as a toe to, to dip into this kind of space of green computing, it's, it's relatively low investment to get involved. The upside is quite low as well, I admit, but the, uh, as in the max, you're not going to get 100% carbon reductions with this, but you will be able to tap out about 10% carbon reductions, and the investment is very low to get to that 10%. So hardware, hardware efficiency. Everything that's being created, everything uh, emitted carbon when it was built, and will emit carbon when it's responsibly decommissioned. Therefore, hardware, devices, you can link this to carbon directly. So if, if our goal is to be carbon efficient, our goal is to be hardware efficient. And this term is called the embodied carbon, sometimes called embedded carbon. I like to use the word embodied carbon of a device. So everything has got carbon. And it can be significant, um, very significant. So this is more for like end user devices, but you can see, um, from like, I'll use my lap, my phone for instance. This, this phones are actually incredibly energy efficient. Um, I've got Android. Um, they will not let you deploy an application on the App Store, which is going to drain the battery. They will, they'll reject it. Um, and they have so many features inside it that will reduce the clock speed. They think that you're not using it. So they really put a lot of effort into making these things incredibly energy efficient because they will be blamed if the battery dies, not the app developers. So that these things are actually incredibly energy efficient as it is. So actually most of the carbon that's emitted from this mobile phone, it's already been emitted. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I'd find it very difficult to emit more carbon from the energy use from this than what's already been emitted. Um, so it depends on, so what's our strategy for this? How do we reduce the carbon emissions of this as a software, in the software space? Um, servers are very different. Servers are, on, on the other end of the spectrum, like a significant amount of the, the carbon emissions for a, a lifetime carbon emissions for a server will be from the energy because they're just pinned at 100%. They don't change clock speeds. They just, they just zoom really fast. Um, so there's two broad categories for hardware efficiency. Like first one is extending the lifespan. I had to buy this new one. I actually hate this one. I got the pixel, I shouldn't say what it is. Um, I hate this one, my old one was fine. It was, it was absolutely fine, but just things stopped working on it. Perfectly fine, things stopped working on it and I had to buy a new one. So if we can extend the lifespan of this, and that's a software story, that's not nothing to do with hardware, that's software. We made this thing obsolescent. We made it obsolescent with the software that we wrote, with the inefficient software perhaps that we wrote. So in the, in the device space, because mostly, most of the emissions are already emitted, our goal is to make, pe make people keep hold of devices for longer, which is, you know, means not making them forced to upgrade because our software stops running on them. On the server space, it's pretty the story is pretty much about increasing server utilization. The global average server utilization on on-premise private data center is still hovering around 10%. 10%. So most kind of on-premise data centers are um, 90% idle, um, and that's a lot of waste. And our goal is to reduce waste. Um, and as I said before, like utilization, remember from the energy proportionality principle, if they're running at 10%, it means they're still consuming a ton of electricity. So, um, so that's kind of the two broad categories of hardware efficiency. Um, oh yeah, so simple maths. If, you, if, you, if this emitted one ton of embodied carbon and my lifespan was two years, two years, that's all I got out of it. Um, then that's 500 kilograms a year. If you just extended it by one more year, you're reducing the year. That's, 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 the, that's the maths you're doing in your head. You're just, you're just reducing the yearly emissions. On the service base, similar story. 
why use five servers? They each emitted about a kilo of tons when they were, when they were built. And you're just running at 20% utilization. Use one server and run at 100% utilization. That's, I mean, there's a cost benefit, obviously, to this as well. But this is just another argument for why you should be increasing your utilization of servers. But that's really the story in the cloud space tends to be that. So hardware efficient application uses the least amount of embodied carbon possible. That is the, the hardware efficiency principle. So measuring, I did say you're gonna do a carbon score. Uh, we are gonna get there now. Can't promise you it's, it's gonna be more exciting because I'm gonna show you an equation. No one, no, one, no one likes to talk with an equation in it, but here we go. Um, there's a couple of ways of measuring, measuring software for emissions. Something you might have heard of called the greenhouse gas protocol. It's what all of our most Fortune 500, 92% of Fortune 500 companies use the greenhouse gas protocol as a method of, of measuring software emissions. Uh, and there's also something that we're working on, I'll, I'll go into in, in, the, in the foundation, which is called a software carbon intensity specification, which is much more targeted towards people who are in the business of building software. What score can you give your, your applications? In the greenhouse gas emissions, there's usually three scopes you're trying, you're trying to basically figure out where your emissions fall into. Scope one is like if you're literally burning some oil in a drum on your property for whatever reason. That's like, that's scope one, right? It tends not to be, it tends to be like a diesel generator or something. Like that, that's your scope one. Your scope two is um, the emissions that you're emitting indirectly. So typically you're buying energy and that energy emitted some emissions. That's your scope two. And your scope three is what's called your, your supply and value chain. Like if it's this laptop, it's all the emissions that this laptop emitted when it was uh, built. If you're in this, and this, is, this has been my world for years and it's so confusing and it's so challenging, but if you're, in, if you're trying to like have conversations with people about your so software emissions and you're just using the greenhouse gas protocol, like if you're in the private cloud and you own your own service, it's fairly easy because all the, you're buying your electricity so your energy usage is scope two. And you're buying your servers. So your embodied carbon is just scope three. But then if you're using like a Microsoft cloud, well, you're not buying the energy, Microsoft's buying the energy. So actually the energy usage of your application falls into your scope three. But then if you're using, if you're using hybrid cloud, mixture of everything, it's just a bit all over the place. And you're sitting there trying to have these calculations and draw up reports and you're like, well, some of it's in scope two, some of it's scope three. If you're running a front end or something like that, all of it's in, in, in energy embodied. I have this conversation with the Windows teams all the time because I talk to the, the cloud team and they just use scope two when they're talking about energy. And I, and I talk to the scope two with the Windows team and they're like, well, our scope two is the energy our developers are using as they're coding Windows. It's not the energy Windows is using. So greenhouse gas protocols is really challenging if you're trying to use that to, to score your applications. Is it even possible? And the greenhouse gas protocol is all about calculating, calculating a total. Um, to calculate a total, you need to know everywhere your software is being used. If you've got like a SaaS product, you know it, it's all your stuff. If you've got um, an open source product, you've got a clue who's using your software. You know, you, you don't know where it's being used. So how can you even possibly calculate a total? Open source makes 90% of an enterprise stack. So we're kind of ignoring 90% of the software. Even if you could, do you have the capability to track who's using your software? Windows team, they, they, they track people only through the insiders built and only through the people who clicked a checkbox that says they're willing to be tracked, which is like 0.1%. But Windows is a billion devices, so you know they've got enough data. So do you have the capability of tracking it? Do you have the permission to track it? It's really, really hard to calculate a total. Um, and do totals even tell the whole story? Like I have this really interesting exercise, which is, you know, imagine you're the, the, the organizational lead who's in charge of reducing the carbon emissions of their, of their software platform. And in Q1, you hired, you're great, you're really excited about your job, you introduce loads of policies and procedures and projects. And in Q1, your carbon emissions were 34 tons in total. And in Q2, they increased to 52 tons. Should you be fired? Or should you be promoted? Should you continue investing in all those projects or should you scrap them? We're all in the software space. The software space is a growth space. If you are working on a software project, statistically, it's because that software project is growing. 
No one tends to like hire large teams for software projects that are decreasing. When software projects go into maintenance mode, they kind of strip the teams away. Statistically, if you're, if you're writing software, you are writing on a, your, your, your product is growing and therefore the carbon emissions will just grow. Um, so how do you know that, that, that it could have grown just because your, 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 your product could have tripled in size? Uh, what's better, what's more useful is a rate. So if your emissions were 3.3 grams per user and it went down to 2.9 grams per user, that's good. Get a promotion, get a bonus. Continue investing in the, in the projects that you're investing in. Um, you're in the right direction. And so that's kind of, now we're into the equation. That's kind of why the, the foundation that we've got a working group, the standards working group, they've, they've created something called a software carbon intensity specification, which links everything I just said together into one equation. And so it's a score for your software. The energy consumed in kilowatt hours, how dirty and clean your electricity is. You multiply that together, that's, that's how dirty your, your, um, the use phase of your application is. You add in the carbon emitted through the hardware your software's running on. And it's per R. So R is something called a functional unit. And you decide your R through, you know, higher application scales. We're using Zoom right now for this meeting. And so this for Zoom might be carbon per minute. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? A carbon per minute value for Zoom. I wonder what the carbon per minute value for Google Meet is. I wonder what the carbon per minute value for Teams is. It becomes more, once things are a rate, it becomes more interesting, it becomes more comparable, it becomes a target that you can then start reducing. Um, it comes to a target that a software team can have. Regardless of the growth of your product, that's a number that you should all be focusing to reduce. And the only way you can reduce that number is by being more energy efficient, using, through some means, using cleaner sources of electricity, and using less hardware, or using hardware more efficiently. And one of the other, other decisions the team decided to make was that you can only really improve your score through eliminations. So let me just really quickly talk about, talk about this. So when people talk about reducing emissions, people just say, I'm gonna reduce emissions. And I'm like, well, how? Because there's lots of different ways of reducing emissions. One method is called abatement. And abatement just means not emitting. I like to think of just carbon molecules in the atmosphere. You're not putting carbon molecules in the atmosphere, that's abatement. If you are putting carbon molecules in the atmosphere, you're really looking at offsets, and there's two types of offsets. One's called neutralization removal, which is like taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in the ground. The trees that get implanted is a carbon removal strategy, putting carbon into the ground. Compensation avoidance is paying someone out not to emit carbon. A good example of this is taking a flight. If you wanted to reduce your emissions of your flight, you can either not take your flight, you can plant some trees, or you can pay someone else who definitely was going to take a flight not to take a flight. Right? Those are, the, those are, those are basically the broad ways of reducing emissions. The, on, the only way to reduce your score is through abatement in the SEI. You can't pay your way to a better score. You can only engineer your way to a better score. Um, which is really important if your organization, especially has what's called a net zero strategy. So you might have heard the term net zero thrown around. It actually has a quite, it's quite a distinct definition of what net zero means. Net zero means by 2050, if you've got a net zero strategy, it means by 2050, you have to eliminate 90% of your emissions, abate 90% of your emissions, not emit the carbon into the atmosphere. And only 10%, the last 10%, you can only neutralize. You can't compensate. You have to find some way of getting that carbon molecule you emitted and putting it somewhere for a long time. That's a net zero strategy. And so the SCI that's being developed, if because it only allows abatement and eliminations, if you were to adopt that in your software product, the only way to reduce your score is to eliminate emissions. So it's a, it's a good strategy to employ. If, you're, if an organization has a net zero target and they adopt the SCI, 
re everything, this whole space is so complicated, but if you just got the SEI score and you just focus on reducing the SEI score, you know that is gonna help them achieve the net zero target. You can be confident that there's a direct connection between that and the other. So, um, long story, um, and that's basically the, the, the software carbon intensity specification. That is, that is what we are delivering. It's a score for, it's a, it's a carbon score in your application. It's currently in alpha, um, and it'll be released in COP27 uh, in November this year. Um, and it also, it's also gonna come with, actually this whole, what I showed you here is part of um, a training and certification program that we're launching at COP27 as well. So you can be certified a green software practitioner which is this material that goes into more depth. And we're also going to be creating a, a, a software carbon intensity practitioner certification as well. So you can be certified as somebody who can measure and uh, uh, an application for on the, on the SCI uh, protocol. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I think that's questions, which probably is happening afterwards. But thank you very much. <laughs>